fast forward, you know, five years later, uh, lost about $150,000. Um, we did triple the sales though. Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I am excited to welcome today's guest because we are going to talk all about product launching and the different strategies that we want to use for product launching. Here's the thing though, a lot of you guys are thinking maybe you're not doing private label yet, or maybe you're not launching a product. Well, guess what? Launching a bundle is very, very similar. So we're going to talk about different strategies of what you can do to successfully launch your bundle without spending a ton of money on marketing and advertising and things like that. And so um, we have a special guest today, but before I get there, make sure that you join the Facebook group. If you want to ask questions and get answers to all of your burning questions about Amazon, about PPC, about bundling, about listing, all this stuff, join our private Facebook community. Why? Well, because there's a ton of experts in the community that can help you, not just myself, but other people, other sellers who've been selling for a really long Long time can actually help you to um, answer some questions you have, get quick responses so that you can move on and grow your business. Mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word today of marketing. Hashtag marketing is the code word for today. So please use that when you are joining the Facebook group because we require a code word. And why we do that is because we don't want a bunch of crazy spammers or people trying to sell and drop affiliate links and things like that into groups. That's just, that's it's just not polite. We don't want to do that in someone else's group. What we want to do is just serve and help each other. And that's what this community is all about. So make sure you go to mommyincome.com slash join us to join the Facebook group. Hashtag marketing is the code word for this week. And now I want to tell you about today's guest. His name is Jordan West. He is the founder and CEO of the, Se the Secrets to Scaling Your e-commerce brand podcast and the, the founder and CEO of um, Mindful Marketing. So we're excited to hear from Jordan. I'm not going to give you any more of his story. I am just going to tell you this. You want to follow my mindful marketing on Instagram because they have the best in Insta stories. They have this one thing in one minute tips that are super awesome. You got to catch them every single day. So make sure you follow them on Instagram, mindful marketing, because Jordan and his uh, co-founder, CEO of um, mindful marketing, Sean as well is uh, they both talk about different things and they're super funny. So you don't, you definitely don't want to miss that. So subscribe to their channel. They have a podcast, the secrets to scaling your e-commerce brand podcast. So you want to look at that as well. But um, Jordan has been doing marketing for a really long time. He's launched, him and his wife launched their own um, children's clothing line and have done really well at that. But I'm not going to tell you any more of his story. I want to hear it directly from him. So Jordan, welcome to the show. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. It is so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. I know we talked before as far as me being on your podcast, and I'm so glad that you're here to be a part of the Amazon Files. So um, I'm not even going to try and jump into your story. It's best coming from you. So tell us a little bit about you. I know there's a taco restaurant involved, a clothing line involved. So uh, give us the, the rundown of your story. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again for, for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so a little bit about my story. I think I was 20, 22 or 23. I'm sure I could calculate it somewhere. And I thought to myself, I want to own a business. You know, I want to get into business and I, I'm kind of just like against school learning. I really love like experiential learning. So I was like, I'm going to buy a business. So I looked through Craigslist and I found a Taco Del Mar restaurant for sale. And I was like, wow, why is this like so cheap? I think it was like $40,000. I'm like, this is incredible. I then found out that they were actually in bankruptcy. The whole chain was. And that's <laughs> why on it was you, so right? <laughs> And I was like, you know what? Who cares? I'm like, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm like, the worst case scenario, I can like spin it into some other taco restaurant or something. So fast forward, you know, five years later, uh, lost about $150,000. Um, we did triple the sales though. So it was, it was really like, we were actually able to get people through the restaurant. We were able to get people, um, you know, going from what it was when we first took over to uh, what it was at the end was amazing, but still we were losing money every single day. Uh, it was just, it was just such a struggle. So through all of that, we had our uh, first child Daphne 
and um, we were trying out cloth diapering uh, for anybody out there. Uh, worst thing ever. I, <laughs> I I don't know even why we tried it, but <laughs> I was um, to say something. I'm like, oh wow, he's a brave soul. <laughs> Oh yeah. I don't like, yeah, we would never now think about cloth diapering. And if somebody asked me, I'd be like, don't try it. Don't just don't do it. So, um, we couldn't find leggings that would fit nicely over top of cloth diapers. And so my wife was a fashion designer. She wasn't really using it much. She was doing some graphic design and she's like, oh, I'm going to make some leggings that go over top of these cloth diapers. And then people saw they're like, wow, those leggings fit super well over top of diapers too, like just regular diapers. And so she brought them to some markets and uh, just would sell out all the time. And then we got our first wholesale order and she's like, oh man, this is like, you know, it was like a $500 order or something. And we're like, whoa, this is like a business. This is incredible. Um, so fast forward now, that was seven, six or seven years ago. Uh, we're now, that brand is now one of four brands up here in Canada um, in that uh, particular business unit. Um, and that's a, a, a very large brand. Uh, we also own another brand down in Arizona um, that has multiple brands attached to it as well, uh, as well as a marketing agency. It's just, it's all kind of just uh, snowballed from there. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where, where, where we're at right now. In your young 20s, you decide to get addicted to business. <laughs> it's funny totally. how, how you, you know, like you start, you buy this taco business and you, you know, get it going and get it revenue. But at the same time, you're like, and we lost about $150,000 and you didn't quit. I think that's, you know, something that you just kind of glossed over for a second. You're like, oh, I bought this first business in my early 20s. I ran it for five years, lost a bunch of money and still proceeded to start more businesses. I find that super fascinating because I think that's a common thing thread among a lot of entrepreneurs, right? Like we, we are, it's almost like we're addicted to getting failure so that we can learn and grow and be like, okay, but let me try this next thing now, because now I know more. Right. So, um, I found that just really fascinating while you were walking through that part. So, um, so when you say you grew these brands, so the clothing brand, I think that is so fantastic. I mean, anytime you can solve a problem with a product like that, with the leggings, I mean, the struggle is real. I remember when my girls were little and trying to put anything on over a diaper was always kind of, especially tights, like forget about it. Like those yeah. were the worst. So I, I love how you solved, you guys solved a problem with, with those leggings. And is that still a, a known brand today? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of our core baby brand uh, up here in Canada that's uh, little and lively it's called um so that was kind of the the brand that that got us going and then we added um men's and women's apparel um and everything we my my wife designs everything everything's made in Canada we don't make everything we have a, a really great manufacturing partner that we work with here uh so we have dwelling apparel then we have a, a pretty laundry which is our uh, pajama brand uh, and then we also have Beck and Jet, which is a new addition uh, to the team, which is um, just everything uh, newborn baby. So bows and bibs and mats and all of that kind of stuff. So that is um, yeah. so fun. So I know that uh, you specialize. So tell me a little bit about how you got into marketing, because of course, you know, you're founder and CEO of Mindful Marketing and uh, you guys do a great job there. So tell me a little bit about how that got started. Yeah, absolutely. So Here's what uh, a lot of you who are listening probably understand that working with your spouse isn't super fun all the time. So I, so we were working together, you know, I was doing the marketing, she was kind of running everything. Um, I'm really good actually running um, companies. I'm the CEO of three of our companies, um, not of Little and Lively or not of Kindred, the Kindred Studio, which is the, the Canadian brands. Um, and it just wasn't, it just wasn't working. And so I, um, I was always really good at the marketing side. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just start a marketing company that helps our brands. And so it just started just me and another guy. We had a few clients, you know, we were kind of taking on whoever. Uh, and then we realized we're like, we're really good. We were taking on everybody but e-commerce clients. And then we realized we're like, wait, we're really good at e-commerce. Um, so from there, we, we specialized down into e-commerce and, and now we're, uh, I, I, I'd like to think we're one of the go-to e-com agencies out there, um, because people understand that, you know, we own a bunch of brands and, uh, and, and this is what we do, right? So, um, so yeah, it's super, super exciting. Um, people always are like, why do you run the agency or why do you own the agency? And it just makes sense for everything that we do really fits well in there. Um, you know, product 
in my mind is number one, always, right? Have a good product that you sell. That's that's number one. After that, it's marketing. Marketing and sales, right? Um, we're we're uh, going to acquire this uh, other agency right now. We looked at their growth over the years and we're like, man, it's like, it's such a, it's a great company, but it's not, it's not growing at the same rate that I would expect. And we look at the founder and he's not a marketer, right? He's not a, a salesperson marketer. And that is a key um, if you're not that person, like don't don't get depressed. If you're not that salesperson marketer, don't be depressed. Find that person. If you're an ops person, find the marketer and salesperson because you have to do that. Sell, like you have to sell. Right. It's like it's a, one of the quotes I I heard about marketing was like you like you have to put out that I'm the best thing you've never heard of, or my product is the best thing you've never heard of. And in order to get people to hear about it, you have to tell them and that's called marketing right so how did you discover that you were good at marketing and or that you liked it um was that b- back with the taco restaurant or was that some other time you discovered that totally yeah so when we had the taco del mar the one thing i was good at was getting people in the door right figuring out that sort of like m- maybe like semi psychology right of figuring out like what do people need to get in here and purchase burritos i just need people coming through the door buying burritos you know <laughs> Well, oh yeah, you had me at taco. Let me tell you that right now. Like I am literally a taco addict. Every time I see any new place or any place has tacos, I'm like, must try it. Even if I didn't like go to a burger place and I see there's tacos on the menu, I'm like, but 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 I have to have these because I'm literally yeah, a taco yeah, yeah. addict. So yeah, I'm like, so that's interesting. And how does that then translate? Because if you're getting people in a door into a retail establishment, is that not different than working with like e-commerce and, and product launches and things like that? Or is it really a lot more similar than than maybe I'm a well, I'll tell you, it's a lot harder getting people into retail locations, right? It's a lot harder actually driving those people in, tracking those people, um, figuring out what actually made them come in. But other uh, besides, uh, sorry, comparatively to digital marketing, right? With digital marketing, we have all this tracking. Even after iOS 14.5, we have incredible tracking that we can do. We can ask people questions. We'll ask these post-purchase surveys that get all sorts of data from people that we couldn't necessarily get if they came into a retail location. Um, it's uh, Digital marketing is way easier than getting people into retail. Um, we're actually, we're c- considering opening a couple of flagship locations uh, across Canada. And I'm, I'm very worried of like, okay, how are we going to track all this? How are we going to know like the efficacy of our ad spend right across? Right. I was thinking that. This. I'm like, how do you track something? Like, Cause right now it's like, you can, you can get somebody to click on something and it's just like, Hey, how'd you hear about us? And you can give them the little checklist and you can require them to answer. Like, how did you know about this product, this lead, this free thing, whatever. But when someone walks into your store, you really have no idea unless you literally ask them, Hey, how'd you hear about us? Then um, how would you really know? So that really is a, a a distinctive difference in being able to track the data and see what's working and what's not. Totally. I mean, coupon code tracking is, is the most simple way to do it, right? Give a unique coupon code for a unique drop. Like that's the old school kind of method of doing it. And it's interesting because after iOS 14.5 and the lack of tracking that we have, that's really what we're trying to do now, right? Is more coupon code tracking, more asking the customer, um, all of that, right? And then and then really trying to continue to use Google Analytics to see the entire customer journey, which traffic is good, which traffic isn't. Uh, all of that is really, really important still. But now we, we really, we like what we call it at our agency is we just no longer have surveillance tracking like we did back in April. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's a very different world than it was in April. And some people are doing OK and some brands aren't. Um, we work with tons of brands and and we're really trying to help the ones that don't get it yet. Um, but it really comes down to it's it's back. It's back to old school marketing. Yeah. Well, the good news is, is that someone like yourself has been in marketing a long time. So, you know, old school and new school and now kind of back to the other one. So, okay, let's talk about product launches because you have mentioned already with several different brands and different products and product lines that you have launched. And I'm going to give like my audience right now, this big, like, aha, like mic drop moment, right? Like, Jordan and his brands are not on Amazon, friends. They're not on Amazon. So you're probably like, oh my gosh, he's killing it in e-commerce and he's not on Amazon. What the what? So tell us a little bit about that and some of the reasons behind it. Because I think, you know, curious minds just want to know, but at the same time, it's like you're succeeding and killing it with all these different products and brands and you're not on Amazon. What is your secret? (laughs) So what what we went out, like when, when we were going to build what we've built, 
we really looked at it. There's there's a couple of different ways that you can look at it, right? You can look at owning your your traffic, and you can look at owning your uh, your customers and building a brand that way, or you can rent traffic, right? Um, and so that's what Amazon is, right? You're renting their traffic if something happens, right? If there's some legislation, if Amazon, um, you know, becomes, uh, you know, a monopoly, right? And they, and they bust them up into a bunch of different companies, you no longer have a business, right? I don't ever want to be in that situation. I learned a lot owning a franchise. And the one thing I learned is that I do not want somebody to control whether somebody is going to buy something from me or not and control my product, control my supply chain, all of that. So uh, we didn't purposefully not go on Amazon. We were just, we just didn't know what to do. We're like, oh, well, let's start with Etsy. Okay, Etsy's working. Uh, well, I've heard of this cool new platform called Shopify. And back then, like in 2015, it was like, nobody was using Shopify, but it was like, you just Google all over. It's like, okay, should we use Wix or Shopify? Oh, I guess the Shopify looks pretty good. Very good decision to do that. I wish I would have invested like a hundred grand in their stock at that time. I know, um, right? Right? I know my I'm, first Shopify store that we opened was like this. Well, we opened it for different purposes. A lot of it was for vendors and suppliers or re the reality of that. But I was like seeing the potential growing and was like, man, this is one of those things where we wish we had like, like those insider tips like way before, like this is going to be huge. Just watch out. So so you started Etsy and then Shopify. Is, is, those are the stores that you have. Well, yeah, yeah. So it first started as Etsy back in, I don't know, 2013, 2014, back back then. And then we eventually moved over to, you know, our own Shopify store. So I think the reason why, um, and I understand this is an Amazon podcast. I, I just want to make my case for being Oh, no, of like just, just so you know, this is not just, I mean, yeah, this is the Amazon files. But what I try to do with having, you know, experts like yourself and all these things is to open the conversation for people to expand their minds and their opportunities for the same reason that you just said, because as, um, I mean, I obviously make my living on Amazon. So I am, I am a, I don't even want to say I'm a big fan. Um, uh, cause I'm not really, I actually, it's like a love hate thing. It's like a really toxic relationship like between toxic. Amazon and everybody. Um, but the reality is, is that it, it's still a really good opportunity for people, but I myself have diversified heavily into other platforms and other places so that or because of that that control you were just talking about the fact that at any moment if, if legislation or if Amazon decides they have to do this or um, there are bills right now in Congress saying that Amazon is a monopoly in these antitrust laws and if they are passed that could change things dramatically so as we're preparing ourselves to start thinking about uh, diversifying or adding uh, additional um, stores or our platforms or outlets for that. Um, these kind of marketing strategies are really important for people to learn ahead of time so that if they are um, finding themselves in situations where they're out of control in their business, that this is a way that they can, you know, kind of uh, get ahead of the game before anything tragic actually happens. Absolutely. So, so what I'm obsessed with is building brands and communities, right? So um, every brand that we, uh, that we acquire um, or build has community base around it. So for instance, it's actually interesting. We were talking about product launches. We just did a, a gated launch last night. So one where we completely password protect the website and we give our customers the password, or sorry, our VIP customers, the password. So anybody who's in our VIP community gets the password. Um, you know, interestingly, in the first hour, we did about 70,000 of sales. People had to enter a password to get onto a website and buy things. And we did that much in sales only from these this small group of people. Community is absolutely incredible. We couldn't do that if we were on Amazon, right? Um, it just wouldn't it just wouldn't work the same way that it works when we own that whole customer journey and we're able to really, uh, I mean, like Amazon has great customer service, awesome. But we really want to own that entire experience with with our customers, and that's that's been our main reason to stay off, right? To stay off of the third party pl platforms. Um, that doesn't mean that that's right for everybody, but for us and the brands that we're building, that's the right move. Now, when you first started with the brands and building the community, did you have products already or did you kind of build the communities around topics and ideas and tips and things like that and then drop products or how, how was that like, how does that work? So I'll give you a couple 
two different examples. So at Kindred, which houses our four Canadian brands, we have a VIP group that's really built around product. People love our product. They talk about our product. It's just a really strong product brand. Um, we'll have like four to five. I'm sure we've had like 10 posts in that group today just talking about product. So we don't. We didn't need to talk about other things in here. Um, we're very family focused. We could have talked a lot about that, but we didn't need to in that group. So um, that that's not going to be the same for everybody listening to this. You probably need to actually um, think about who your who your customer or who your avatar is, and then start to talk about those things and bring value that way. Um, for us, yeah, that one's just totally product centric. People love it. Uh, on the other hand, we've got a massive group of people um, at one of our Arizona brands, Keep Nature Wild. Uh, we've got a group called the Wild Keepers, and their entire mission is to pick up trash off of trails. And so at that brand, we pick up a pound of trash for every product that we sell. Um, so the Wild Keepers are the ones who do that, and their entire focus is keeping nature wild. So you can see that's not there, there is absolutely nothing product focused whatsoever about that group, but they help fulfill the mission of the company. So two totally different ways um, to go about it. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that, that we can go about it. You know, on the marketing side, we have groups um, specifically for different kinds of marketing or different kinds of people. I host a mastermind for, um, you know, eight figure plus um, sellers. Um, that's a really great small group of people. Um, just, just I, I hope that, that kind of gets people's wheels turning of like what kinds of groups you can form and how you can really get people together in a real community. Yeah, that's super awesome. I mean, depending, I know all kinds of product lines and all different things. I mean, I'm always talking to everybody about whether it's product development or um, creating their first bundle or figuring out what they want to sell or maybe what they want to create and develop. It's all about um, solutions to problems and needs. And, uh, you know, behind those solutions are people with problems. And so uh, getting together and connecting people with brands, um, that's just the main way. You know, we're all, you know, starving for communication and connection these days especially with, uh, you know, pandemic and lockdowns and all kinds of other stuff going on. Um, so, you know, more and more groups and communities are popping up for specific topics and niches uh, specifically. So um, I really think that's always a great idea to be able to start something even with your brand and have people, you know, chime in. And I'm sure in your group with your products, you get suggestions from your own customer saying, hey, can you make a product like this? Or can you make it in this shape, size, color, you know, whatever it is. And so you get direct feedback feedback from your customers. And that's something I love about the off Amazon product, um, having products off of Amazon is that you really do um, have the opportunity to directly com um, communicate with your customers to see what they want, get real feedback from them, not just like, oh, my product wasn't delivered on time, but actually like, what do you like about the product? What don't you like? What worked? What didn't work? How can we serve you better? And so I feel like that is really a, a great way to start establishing brands um, is to have that, that open conversation and owning your traffic and owning your customers is part of that, um, you know, part of that process. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about, I know that you love the psychology and the ideas and things, mechanics and processes behind like launching um, products specifically, but can you, I know you talk about the gated launch a lot. So talk to me a little bit about the gated launch. What is it and why is this strategy so helpful when launching products? Yeah, totally. So we, I came upon this idea of the gated launch uh, years ago. I was reading a book by Jonah Berger called Contagious. It was either Contagious or Invisible invisible influence one of one of his books <laughs> and uh and he was talking about this clothing brand that was really struggling online uh they they just weren't pe people just weren't really into it it was just going downhill and this clothing brand decided to rebrand but with the rebrand they decided that the only way that people were going to be able to buy their clothes is with a launch so they would launch every single friday uh, they would password protect their site and they would give the password to their email list. And that was the only way. And so they went from being a struggling brand that wasn't really selling a lot to selling out every single Friday within about 10 minutes, they would just sell out of everything that they were launching. And I was like, huh, that's super interesting. I'm going to implement this. So of course I waited about three or four years, thought about it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, how would we implement that? So that that's sort of the, that was the basis of, 
of what we decided to do. And so we created this VIP community and we thought, okay, we're going to give our VIP community early access to some of these launches because we tended to sell out back, back then when we didn't have our manufacturing down great. We tended to sell out really fast. And so we're like, okay, let's give our VIP members access. So essentially I'll, I'll walk you through exactly how we do it. So for about two weeks, we tease these big launches, right? And we let our, our VIP members know, we let everybody know, Hey, this is what we're going to be. Um, th this is what we're going to be launching. We tell them all about it. We get them really excited. And then uh, generally two hours before we launch to the public, we password protect the site and we give uh, and, and we launch the product and then we give our VIP members and our SMS or a text message list the password. And that's the only way that they can get onto the site is if they do that. If they enter the password on the site, they enter. And it's incredible. Like when you think about the psychology of it, right? Who in the world would take these extra steps to get into a website, right? There's tons of websites out there, right? Putting uh, impediments in people's way somehow gets them to buy more, right? Um, it, it's, it's almost like that line at the club, right? When, you, when you're driving down the road or, or like at a, like, you know, I'm thinking like in Portland, you drive by these restaurants, you're like, man, there's so many people waiting outside of these restaurants. There must be something there. I, I need to go get in line and wait two hours to see what's there. And then you eat there and you're like, oh, okay, like, it was pretty good. I mean, I don't know why I waited two hours for it, but <laughs> um, very similar idea, right? Where, where we're really trying to create that buzz and that hype and it works. It works every single time. Um, our conversion rate goes up to like 10% during these launches, right? 10, 15%. We had a launch last August um, where we our supply chain was a lot better uh, um, at that time, right? This year, it's been absolutely horrendous. Um, but we yeah. did in 20, in 24 hours, we did $250,000 of sales. Um, 120 of that was in the first hour to our VIP group. Uh, just absolutely astounding when you think about people having to jump through hoops to purchase the product. Um, so that's essentially a gated launch. Uh, and and it, it works. It works every single time I have somebody in my mastermind um, who started implementing it. Um, he said that he's had the biggest, he did a $200,000 launch in the first two hours. Um, massive numbers, right? Ma like massive numbers. And it, it just, it just works, but you have to build a community first. You can't just go and start doing that. You can't do it to your email list. Email is not the, that is not a VIP channel. Um, but in my mind, SMS and that Facebook VIP community, that is the golden ticket in 2021. So let's go back for just a second because you were talking about because I was thinking that as you were talking about this gated launch and how like, okay, you're actually launching to a group of people that you already have within your fold. So um, what are what are some of the beginning strategies that you started with in order to build said community? Um, is there specific marketing strategies? Did you have giveaways? Like how did you introduce your awesome brand to the world? At, at the very beginning, it was really just product focused, right? We were just, it was Instagram. That was back in 2015 where, you know, every time you'd post, you'd reach all your audience. Um, that was really how we started. But building the VIP community um, is a, a labor, right? It takes a, a long time. So one thing that we did for a long time is every single new customer who would order, we would send a personalized video to them, inviting them into the VIP community. Um, unfortunately, that's something that we decided uh, that we we looked at the numbers and we decided that it actually was no longer something that we were going to do. But we did it for about a year and we had tons of people join in the VIP community um, that way. Uh, we'll on on emails, um, post purchase emails, we'll invite people to join the community. We really want people who have purchased from us to join that community um, and uh, essentially think of traffic like this. And I'm sure most of you have probably heard this before. There's five levels of traffic is what people normally talk about, right? So traffic level number one are, is awareness. Nobody's ever heard about you. Uh, so those are like your, that's your typical cold audience. Number two, they've engaged with you in some sort of way. Maybe they've watched one of your videos. They've liked your page. They've, they, they kind of know about you. Number three, they've actually gone to a product page and they've actually looked at a product. These people are starting to get warm. Uh, level number four, these are people who have added to cart. So they've made some sort of uh, um, some, some sort of gesture that they want to buy your product. Number five, they've actually uh, purchased your product. That's where everybody stops. Everybody stops at level five. 
hello, the money is made at levels six, seven, and eight, right? That's where you want to get people. And no one does that. No one puts people into level six, seven, and eight. So <laughs> level six are people who, you know, now they're like, oh, I want to buy something again, right? Level seven, they're like, oh, I'm going to start telling my friends, right? Level eight, they're going to actually advocate for you. And they're going to be like, hey, hey, have you heard about this brand? Like, I love these guys. This is a cool brand. And I'm going to be cool by telling you about them. Um, that's where you want people, right? I, I don't care about those other levels. Those other levels are awesome to get people purchasing for a first time, but I don't want people purchasing once. That's a, that's a big, the red flag. When I look at a brand and people only purchase once, there is a huge problem with that brand. Um, so I want people purchasing over and over and over. And you'll see like, if, like looking at our analytics, our returning customer rate monthly is like 70%. Wow. That is and so yeah. I don't pay to acquire those customers, right? Those customers just keep coming back and back and back. Well, and that's one of the marketing things you, you learn, you know, I, hopefully along the way people are learning that is that it is a lot easier to get someone to purchase a product from you that's already purchased a product from you rather than Absolutely. acquiring a new customer. So, it, you know, it's like the fortunes in the follow-up, right? We've got to be following up with the customers that purchase from us in order to, um, you know, establish that trust, establish the fact that like, yes, we are not going to leave you off just because that you put, you know, your credit card information in that we are going to continue to support you and ask for your ideas and provide you with good quality service and products that you want to come back to. Um, so yeah, that is, that is super important when it comes to um, th that type of marketing. So um, when you're doing these gated launches to these communities and, um, you know, you introduce a new product, is that generally when you see this major uptick in sales or is it just kind of a relaunch? of some other stuff in, in a different way. No, 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 we're always launching new products, right? So we're, that's, that's something in apparel that's just incredibly important. Continue to launch. Like I can't think of who doesn't in apparel, maybe Lulu, Lulu Lemon doesn't launch new stuff all the time, but they're, they're a bit of a, uh, an outlier when it comes to that, but you got to continually be releasing new colors, new prints, new graphics. Um, then that's where we really see um, the uptick. So what are your thoughts then about, um, you know, different advertising? Because I know you guys have an agency and you talk a lot about, you know, ad spend and different things like that. Um, you know, the different types of ads and products, whether it's Google ads, Facebook ads, influencer style promotions, like what is your favorite method of advertising? In 2021, who knows? <laughs> Right. Well, honestly, honestly, no, nobody, nobody knows right now. I mean, I, I run millions of dollars of ad spend and we don't know Google, Google's incredible. The reason why Google wasn't hit by iOS 14.5 is that Google is intent and search based, right? So they weren't relying on all of this customer data to target people, right? They're just like, we're search based. This is what we do. Um, Google's the, the first place that I would put put people if they're trying to get off of Amazon um, or, or build a, a brand aside from Amazon. Um, also, I'm sure a lot of people that listen to you know Amazon PPC and Google is um, Amazon PPC, but on steroids, right? Like yeah. um, it's that that's the first place that I would go in 2021. Before this, before this year, I'd say Facebook, Instagram always, right? That is just like, that is where your customers are. I don't know now. TikTok, Awesome. TikTok influencers is incredibly cheap traffic right now. Um, we just worked with an influencer, uh, 3 million views, 625,000 likes on the post, um, 5,000 shares, uh, all this like incredible, right? When you think about CPMs out there right now, we paid $4,000 for that. If that was Facebook traffic, we would have paid a hundred, I, I believe around a hundred grand for that at $20 CPMs. So like, just, just there, there are really great deals out there. It just depends where you are in the marketing space, who you're trying to target. Um, you know, for, for us targeting moms 25 to 40, that's a really expensive demographic to target. Um, but again, Google, that's where I would go first. Google, that's super important because I think what a lot of people don't know, especially on Amazon, and this is why I advocate so much for writing the best um, 
product descriptions and using um, the data, naming your photos, naming your images, naming everything that you possibly can, because our big brother Google is um, even far bigger and far more has farther of a reach than even on Amazon. So when I tell people you're creating your product detail page on Amazon, that ranks in Google. That is SEO that you can use for free that Google will pick up on. So making sure that you're um, targeting those proper keywords, that's almost like a free advertisement because it will rank on Google. And at that point, you can even drive more traffic even to your Amazon listing by using um, specific uh, Google, the way that, that Google is picking everything up. Because again, you said it's search and intent. So it's not just about, um, you know, th that customer data. It's somebody going into, you know, those are, they say those are, the Amazon's not a search engine, except for it kind of is. A lot of people, when they go there the first time, they're, they're typing in their product. Most people, when they're looking for a product, they go to their Amazon app, they open it and they type in whatever product, brand, name, anything. And even yeah. if they saw it on Instagram, a lot of people would be like, oh, this is on Instagram. I'll see that. I wonder if it's on Amazon. And they go there. So um, advertising, regardless of where it is and where it's being seen, is still um, the best way to be found out, discovered, and create awareness around whatever brand and product that you're um, that you're doing. So um, one more question about that is, um, how do you, do you still feel like the email list is the cream of the crop, the um, the best way to continue communicating with your customers and audience? I think email works really well alongside of SMS. So think of SMS as that's your notification arm, right? That you're going to let people know something is going on. Um, email is, is more of a communication tool to, to communicate more to your customer. Um, I'd say if, if you could only build one of them, build SMS all day long build SMS. Uh, one of the brands that we just acquired um, has an email list of about 20,000 people, average open rate of 10%. I am not happy with that whatsoever. We're gonna move everything over to SMS, right? We'll, we'll continue email, but that that's not doing anything for us comparatively to an SMS list, um, where if people stick on that list, they love you, right? Uh, everybody knows how to hit stop if they don't wanna get texts. Um, so if somebody stays on that list, they are worth a lot of money to you. Um, that is what I would build first is SMS and then next email. Awesome. Yeah, that is just the new wave of, of, you know, being informed because everybody has their phone. And I don't know about you, but I will always check a text message before I text, check an email because the inbox keeps piling up, right? So oh, yeah. um, do you find that anybody's reluctant to give you their phone number because of that? Oh, absolutely. And those they just aren't necessarily our ideal customer, right? If they don't want to, that that's that's okay. They can go on our email list, but they it may not hit the inbox all the time, right? We can't always hit the the um, the non promotion tab, right? Um, so if people really love the brand, they'll jo they join the email or they join the SMS list. Um, also, th some things that you need to know about SMS is like don't don't text people more than once a week. I mean, unless you're running a launch, like we'll probably text a couple of times this week during the launch. But yeah, no, no more than no more than once a week uh, on that SMS list. Where with email, I, I suggest emailing three to four times a week, right, to stay top of mind. Um, and remember on that on that email list, even if they're not opening your emails, they're continually seeing your name. Um, so it's it's very important to continue to email as well. Um, it's just you you've got to hold SMS a lot higher than email. So this has been so uh, informative for all uh, across the boards and different things and, and being able to, you know, talk about the gated launch, which I think is completely brilliant um, <clears throat> because I think that there's like this misnomer that if people have to jump through hoops, they're not going to, they'll just, you know, the, the, in this instant age where they can just swipe and keep going and keep scrolling, that they're not going to go through the extra steps in order to get your product. But the truth is, is it, it creates that exclusivity, which then also creates that FOMO that everybody has like, oh, well, if I don't use this password to get into the site to see what they're selling, then what am I missing? You know, and totally. so I think that's a really, you know, it, it, it's almost the opposite effect that we, a lot of us assume that because of all the different hoops that they have to jump through, that they're not going to make a purchase when indeed it's kind of that reverse psychology, right? Of people being totally. able to say, oh gosh, what's behind this curtain? I really need to know. I must, you know, it's funny when you mentioned the people like lining up outside, we have a super popular like breakfast breakfast brunch place around here that like local
locals know, like we don't go there on weekends. Like there, you, you will never get a seat because it's literally the best and the busiest, you know, little tiny restaurant um, for yeah. breakfast and brunch ever. Um, but people like come like anyone visiting the area and they're on there, they're, they're waiting in line for hours to be able to go to the restaurant. We're like, uh, we'll go on Tuesday morning when like no one, when it's not as busy or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's funny how you say that because that is the psychology of it all. The groups and crowds and lines create curiosity. And even totally. if people might not be buying at the time, they still want to know what's everybody doing over there? Why are they yeah. in line? What are they waiting for? Something must be good inside or all the, these people wouldn't be gathering. So yeah. um, I wish there was a way to create that visually, uh, digitally, right? For people like showing some sort of like waiting in line for like, oh, you're next in line. You know, there's 500 people in front of you waiting to make this purchase. Like it creates that, oh my gosh, am I going to get in kind of thing? So totally. Um, we, we need to come up with like an app or something that, that helps that build that anticipation of like, oh, you're, you know, you're in line and you're here, but there's so many people ahead of you, <laughs> that yes. digital line that people are waiting in. That's absolutely brilliant. Well, I appreciate all of your insights and everything here. So where can people go to learn more about your agency and your marketing strategies and how they can grow uh, their brands uh, both um, on, well on Amazon and off Amazon? I know you guys have a lot of strategies um, to help wherever you're launching your brand. Absolutely. So you can uh, listen to our podcast at Secrets to Scaling Your E-Commerce Brand. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Jordan West Marketer. And then you can go to mindfulmarketing.co and connect with us there. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all of your insight. You guys check out the podcast. They have tons and tons of really good experts talking about e-commerce across the board, everything from subscription boxes to, you know, global supply chain issues, all these different things. I've seen so many of these experts um, give such great advice. So make sure you're listening to this scaling secrets to scaling your e-com brand podcast. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Thank of course, you. all the links will be in the show notes to contact Jordan and his team to be able to connect with the podcast and all of that stuff. So Jordan, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure. I've learned so much and I know everyone else has learned a lot as well as far as thinking about marketing, thinking about their customers and creating those experiences and um, groups. And of course, that gated launch, that was such a, a great tip. So thank you so much for that. You guys, I know you could be anywhere else listening to any other thing at this moment. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.